off it with here. Um, on behalf of the entire Department of Defense, uh, Secretary extends uh, uh, our deepest condolences to the Rowat family, the Indian military, uh, and the people of India after the tragic death of India's Chief of Defense Staff General Rowat in uh, a helicopter crash. He left an indelible mark on the course of the U.S.-India Defense Partnership and was at the center of the Indian Armed Forces transformation into a more jointly integrated warfighting organization. The Secretary had the privilege of meeting with him earlier this year and I really came to view him as a valued partner and a friend of the United States. Our, our thoughts and prayers are with the entire Wawat family uh, as they lost other family members in this crash and of course the families of all the victims of this uh, terrible terrible incident where we are deeply saddened by the loss on a schedule note the secretary will meet tomorrow with israeli defense minister benny gantz uh, here at the pentagon um, as you can imagine uh, they plan to discuss uh, you, the United States' commitment to Israel's security and shared concerns regarding Iran's nuclear provocations and destabilizing actions in the region. We will, of course, issue a readout of the visit after the fact, and I think, as you know, just as in the past, there'll be, uh, there'll be open uh, press access to the arrival and to the very top of the, of the meeting. Um, also, I think, as uh, you may have seen or heard, President Biden signed an executive order today uh, entitled Catalyzing America's Clean Energy Economy Through Federal Sustainability uh, that uh, demonstrates how the United States will lead by example in tackling the climate crisis. And work is already underway across the Department of Defense to leverage scale and procurement power to drive clean, healthy, and resilient operations. Uh, this executive order and its accompanying federal sustainability plan offer a clear statement of the president's priority to address the existential crisis of climate change. And as I think you all know, DOE is the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the federal government. And so we're committed to, be, uh, to, to do our part. Our climate objectives, which we have uh, uh, laid down our climate uh, strategy, are well aligned with our mission goals. In fact, um, they are mutually reinforcing. Uh, integrating clean energy can help enhance our resilience to all threats, including the effects of climate change. They can help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and help us compete for the energy technologies that are essential to, uh, to our future success. So you can read the Federal Sustainability Plan on sustainability.gov, and there's a fact sheet on whitehouse.gov where you'll find some highlights of the department's ongoing activities. And with that, we'll go to questions. Bob. Thank you, John. A um, couple quick questions on Ukraine. Has Secretary Austin begun consulting with um, his NATO counterparts about uh, the possibility of reinforcing the eastern flank beyond what was already in the works? No. There have been no um, additional consultations about that specific potential outcome, Bob. Or, or weapon sales to Ukraine? Uh, you mean security assistance to Ukraine? Uh, there's, uh, I, we have no new announcements or decisions to make with, or, with respect to any additional security assistance with Ukraine. I think uh, you know uh, we did approve, President Biden approved a $60 million security assistance package. The final elements of that will be arriving in Ukraine this week. Can you say what those are? Um, small arms and ammunition is the, the, the latest. Uh, um, the latest units that will be uh, transferred to Ukraine's defense forces this week. This week. Yeah. Another quick question, if you don't mind, is on the sexual assault prevention and the military justice reform legislation. Can you say how far the Defense Department has gotten this year in implementing the changes that it has talked about um, in that regard? In other words, prior to the legislation. Well, I mean, you're, you're not talking about just UCMJ reform, I, I, I take it. We, we have, uh, I mean, the, big, the biggest thing we did to, this year was, you know, get the Independent Review Commission stood up, get their findings uh, and recommendations uh, all tabulated, and then you saw that uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks issued an implementation roadmap to, to give us um, a, a process by which we could start to implement all those recommendations. Um, and UCMJ reform and the legislative proposal that the department uh, 
uh, was, uh, was fostering uh, was one such uh, accomplishment. Uh, we, um, we are working hard to develop a, a dedicated workforce uh, on, for uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment counselors and advisors. That's going to take some time, but uh, the initial work of that is ongoing. Uh, we are looking hard at uh, victim support and prevention techniques uh, and trying to capture lessons learned throughout the force. Um, and uh, we are, as I think we've talked about, we are um, taking a hard look at installation by installation. Uh, we're already doing that to, to look at what the unique challenges are in installations both at home and abroad because some um, are just better equipped to deal with this challenge than, than others. Some of it is just based on geography and where they are and how much support they can get or how much resources they have applied to this. So there's been a lot of work, uh, and it will be ongoing. This is not something we're going to take our foot off. Thank you. Yeah. Abraham. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, John. It, it, following up his question on Ukraine, um, do, there's, there's been this phrase thrown around by, by administration officials as well as DOD officials called uh, further invade U, uh, Ukraine, this idea of if uh, Putin were to further ingrain Ukraine, that would trigger uh, some some results. I wonder, from a DOD perspective, does further invade Ukraine mean putting Russian troops in Donetsk and Luhansk? I think it means uh, additional incursions uh, into Ukraine, violating their territorial integrity and their sovereignty uh, with additional units inside Ukraine. Inside the borders of Ukraine. Part of Ukraine, from U.S. perspective. I'm sorry. And Donetsk and Luhansk are part of Ukraine. Of course, they are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, on, on the on the meeting tomorrow with uh, Minister Gans, um, does the secretary share with his Israeli counterpart um, the same conviction that there there needs to be uh, room for diplomacy with Iran, and that diplomacy for now is the best way? to deal with its nuclear program. D does B Minister Gantz share the yeah. I, 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 I cannot, cannot speak for M Minister Gantz, Fadi. I think you can understand I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't do that. I, I'm not even always very eloquent speaking for this defense secretary. So I, I don't want to get in the habit of talking for another leader. But, um, and there's always a but on something like that, <laughs> uh, the way you phrased it, uh, perfectly captures where Secretary Austin is, that, uh, as he said, no problem in the Middle East is easier to solve with a nuclear-armed Iran. He fully supports the diplomatic effort and outreach that the administration is pursuing in Geneva to try to get back into uh, the joint comprehensive plan of action. He believes that uh, diplomacy should absolutely be in the lead. So will the secretary be making that message clear again in, in the meeting with, with Mr. Gantz or only discuss the concerns that both leaders share about, about Iran? Well, look, Iran will absolutely be uh, on the agenda tomorrow. And, uh, and as I said, we'll do a readout of that. So I, I don't want to preview or get ahead of a conversation that hasn't happened yet. But whenever Minister Gantz and Secretary Austin have a chance to speak. Iran is right there at the top of the list of things that they talk about. And the Secretary has been and will continue to be clear, publicly and privately, uh, about um, how he sees uh, the, the, the most appropriate path to pursue uh, an Iran that doesn't have a nuclear weapon. But as you also know, his job is to defend this nation. His job is to look after our national security interest in that part of the world, every part of the world. Uh, and that means making sure that we have the right resources, capabilities uh, in, in the region, specifically in the region, uh, to protect those national security interests. And so he's, he's going to remain laser focused on that. Um, and a key piece of that, Fadi, is also to, and you've seen this when he's been over there, is to make sure that, um, that we're helping Contribute to the capabilities of our allies and partners, uh, and our, our defense partnership with Israel is ironclad. We are still committed to their uh, qualitative military edge. So, I mean, all of that will also be part of the discussion. I'm, I'm quite sure. Yeah, in the back there. Thanks, John. Caitlin Burke with CBN News. So with no religious exemptions granted so far for the COVID vaccine, there's concern that mil members of the military have been stripped of their religious liberties. 
can you just speak to that? I know you have in the sure. past. Sure. And to why that exemption is so rarely granted. Yeah. Um, you're right. There haven't been any religious exemptions granted by the services. I would ask you to to speak to the services about their exemption policies. That's not something that's centrally managed at at, uh, at the secretary's level. Um, th they are always rare. Re religious exemptions uh, for medical mil military medical requirements are, are just they are typically historically very rare. Uh, I can't speak to each and every case. Again, I point you to the services. Um, but this has absolutely nothing to do with uh, with trampling on the religious liberties of uh, our men and women in uniform. I mean, one of the things that when you sign up to serve in the military, one of the many things that you you sign up to defend is is uh, the right to to worship, the the right to or not to worship. Um, and we obviously respect that uh, inside the ranks of the military. That's why the services each have chaplain corps, uh, you know, corps of people dedicated to looking after the spiritual needs of, uh, of men and women in uniform as well as their families. So uh, th this is not about, it's not about liberties. Um, it's about uh, a military medical requirement to keep them safe, to keep their families safe, to keep their units safe. Um, and the secretary uh, continues to strongly believe that, that these, vac these vaccines are uh, the best way to do it with respect with respect to COVID. Uh, and just because none have been approved doesn't mean that uh, they can't still be applied for. Uh, as we've said in the past, and not, not everybody, look, there'll be some medical exemptions and people that, whose doctors won't, you know, don't want them to get the vaccine. We understand that. Uh, and for those who, uh, who d strongly feel like, like their case merits a religious exemption, they are absolutely entitled to ask for that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Liz Frieden with Fox News. Uh, with the NDA day, NDAA that the House passed last night, um, is there anything not included in it you wish would have been included in it? And as far as the Senate passage goes, uh, are you hopeful that they're going to you know, pass it in time? So I'm, uh, because it's still working its way through legislatively, I'm, I'm going to refrain from providing uh, a, a detailed comment on uh, what's in it and what's not in it. As you rightly pointed out, it has to now go to the Senate and then ultimately to the White House. Um, um, I'm sorry, and your second question was? Is there anything that uh, this year makes it different than in years past? Uh, is it well, I mean, the big, I mean, the, the, the big muscle movement is the sexual assault, sexual harassment provisions. I mean, that's a historic, um, that's a historic initiative here, removing those crimes and related crimes, the prosecution of them outside the chain of command. Um, there's lots of puts and takes. Again, I, I really would rather not uh, deliberate over all of them while it still has to go to the Senate. Um, we stand by the budget that we submitted uh, under President Biden's in total budget uh, uh, back in the spring, stand by uh, every article in there and everything that we, uh, that we felt we, we needed. So I would point you back to our budget testimony in terms of where we are and on, on all these various programs. I remember now, I think your second question was uh, about how fast do we want this. Uh, obviously, we, we, we'd like an appropriated budget as quickly as possible. You saw the secretary commented uh, on Monday about continuing resolutions. Now, that was about the pro prospect of a year long. I mean, we've got a, a CR now that gets us into February, but a CR is very limiting. It doesn't allow us to start new programs, um, and it ties our hands in other areas. So um, so we would obviously like to see the, a, a budget uh, def uh, NDAA passed as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Now you have a question on a completely different topic. Um, the fuel leakage at Red Hill in Honolulu. Uh, I was told the Navy's going to put out a statement today on it. Um, but were you, do you know anything about what their plan is moving forward? And, and how does it uh, I mean, affect the fleets in the Pacific? What's the, what's the impact? Yeah. So let me first say that uh, the Secretary is obviously aware of this issue, and he's following it closely. Uh, and nothing's more important to him and, or, or to the department, and I know the Navy feels this way as well, than the health and welfare uh, of our people and their families. Um, and uh, obviously we're all deeply concerned uh, by the prospect that contaminated water would have found its way into on-base residences um, and into the daily lives uh, and diets uh, of our people. So it's of 
significant concern to the secretary. Now, he's been in touch with the secretary of the Navy. As you know, the secretary of the Navy and the chief of naval operations were out in uh, Hawaii just a, a, a couple of days ago uh, doing town halls, talking to experts, trying to get their arms around this. I certainly won't get ahead of their investigative efforts or what decisions they might make. Um, uh, so I'll point you to the Navy for if, in fact, they're going to have some sort of an announcement or, or something to speak to today. Um, but it is something that the Secretary is uh, very closely monitoring and very much in touch with Navy leaders on. Thank you. Yeah. Janie. Thank you, John. Um, the commander of the U.S. Army in Japan, General Bowell, said at the uh, uh, annual podium yesterday that uh, he called, hold on a second. That his quote said that the combined anti-aircraft defense must be strengthened in response to threat from North Korea, China, Russia. And he also pointed out that the countries are collective threat acting. And the, my question is, China is interfering with the missile defense system in U.S. and South Korea. Are the, are the missile system of the U.S. and South Korea effectively working against the threat from those countries? This is the kind of capability that um, we not only believe we need in the region, but that we need to continually review and, um, and upgrade as, as necessary. And I think the general was speaking to um, to that need, to that the importance of that capability. I, I, I think this all folds very significantly into the Secretary's vision of integrated deterrence. And you heard him talk about this out at the Reagan Forum, uh, this uh, fully netted um, effort to, uh, to get capabilities and operational concepts working together with modern technology uh, uh, to help change the calculus of any would-be foe. And what you heard the Secretary talk about, and I think it gets to the General's point, that um, that it, it's not just about uh, U.S. joint forces and capabilities working together, but combined as well with our allies and partners. Um, um, I won't talk to the specifics of defense systems uh, on the peninsula, but as you well know, the Secretary was just out there, and he had a lot of good discussions with Minister Sub and, and President Moon uh, about the defensive capabilities that we continue to have on the peninsula um, and, uh, and how we can keep those robust. And I, I would just tell you that, um, that uh, it's not something we ever just sack on and say, OK, it's perfect. We got it right. We're not going to change it. It's something that air and missile defense in particular is something that we always want to review um, and adjust as necessary. Thank you, Ben. You're welcome very much. Travis. Hey, John, thanks. Um, I wanted to follow up on the UAP group that Deputy Secretary Hicks um, recently created because there was some significant movement on Capitol Hill about it. Um, is that group currently active in collecting and analyzing data from the services? Or if it's not, is there some timeline of when it's expected to be fully stood up and in, in operational? You know, Travis, I can't sit here and tell you for sure that there's, like, been an initial kickoff meeting. I mean, this, the deputy secretary did launch the, and establish this group, and we talked about it last week, I think. Um, so it is active. It is — it's a real thing. I mean, when the deputy secretary signs out a memo establishing a group, then it is established. But I don't have an update for you today on sort of what the battle rhythm is and how they're um, — how they're uh, getting their arms around this. It's important to remember, it's not like this is a, it's not like it's a board of directors, but it, it, it's really about a process through which we can better collect reports, assess them, analyze them, uh, and then uh, make recommendations to policymakers as a result of them. That, so uh, I want you to think more process and procedure and less about it being some sort of stationary uh, a stationary, you know, a group that uh, that uh, sits in an office somewhere and and, uh, and has daily meetings. It's it's really about making sure that we are doing a better job at collating the information. As you know, it was um, prior to this kind of coming in sporadically um, from uh, mostly from 
from pilots in the Navy and the Air Force. And, um, and there wasn't a common set of rules and procedures for how that information was being taken in and, and analyzed. If I could just follow up on it, because um, there is legislation on the Hill that deals with how it would be collected and who would do the collecting. So I'm wondering about, you know, the department is very is vast. What are the mechanisms that DOD is using to collect this information? Are there actual individuals that go out and get it? Or are individual units, all the units within the department being educated on how it should be collected and how it should be filed? Can you talk at all about how that work is being done? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think as as we talked about when we rolled out this group, um, they they will be focusing on proactively identifying objects. So how that's going to be done, I don't know. Uh, and they've just recently been established, but it's um, it's it's about trying to again actively identify objects rather than just focusing on objects that were already observed but not identified. So, again, what that's going to look like, I don't know. Um, clearly, they're still going to be interested in reports that are organic and are coming in uh, just intrinsically from pilots that see things that they can't identify. So, I mean, my supposition would be that it'd be a little bit of both, you know, trying to find ways to, as I said, more proactively identify objects, also taking in reactive reports that we get from aviators. Okay, let me uh, go to the phones here. Uh, Louis Martinez. Hey, John. Um, you mentioned with regard to the Hawaii fuel uh, incidents that the secretary is monitoring it closely. Um, given that, Hawaii um, has a large joint presence um, of the services. Is there consideration maybe to expanding um, whatever looks uh, are ongoing right there at Pearl Harbor beyond there to some of the other bases of the, uh, belonging to the other services? Louis, I don't think we're at that point right now. That's not to say we might not need to get to that point, uh, but I think we'll whatever. I think we need to be informed by what the Navy's learning here. And uh, they have just launched an investigation into this. And uh, um, I think uh, that will greatly inform wh whether there needs to be uh, something additional done uh, to, to look at other bases a a across the force. That said, I don't want that to be interpreted as, uh, you know, we, we're, uh, uh, we don't take issues of contamination seriously. Obviously, we obviously do, and so uh, there's an expectation that service leaders and base commanders, installation commanders, um, uh, are constantly reviewing and looking at uh, their own environmental standards and how those standards are being met so that uh, our, our, our families, our, our men and women and, and their families can can rely, reliably live on base uh, and safely live on base. That's something that we expect leaders to do all the time. Uh, so uh, I think we'll uh, we'll see what what the Navy learns here. Again, he's monitoring this closely, and uh, and if there are other decisions that need to stem from what they learn, um, I'm I'm sure he will uh, he will listen closely uh, to that kind of advice and counsel, and 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 we'll do the right things. We'll do the things that we need to do to to keep our people safe. This I mean, we take this very seriously. Uh, you know, the reports are deeply concerning of of people having to uh, ingest or. Um, or have, be exposed to contaminated water in military housing. I mean, that is no small matter. So uh, he's going to stay closely looped in with the Navy uh, throughout this process. Yeah, so. Uh, hello, John. Um, I would like to go back to uh, um, uh, Bob's question about uh, reinforcing the defense of the eastern flank of NATO. Um, I understand there are no, uh, no more consultations. But is the Pentagon actively preparing uh, sending uh, supplemental uh, forces or troops or weapons? Well, I, I, I don't mean to leave you with the impression, that I, don't, I, I hope I didn't do that with my answer to Bob, that there's not going to be any more consultations. We continue to consult with allies and partners about what we're seeing. Um, but uh, to your question about additional capabilities that the National Security Advisor said, um, you know, there, we're not at that point right now. I mean, what Mr. Sullivan said was, if there is a further incursion and invasion into Ukraine, and if our 
the NATO allies uh, request additional capabilities to assist them um, with their own defensive uh, needs or requirements, then we would positively look at those requests. So we're just not there yet, Sylvie. Okay. And uh, still saying, you know, staying in the if, um, how long would it take uh, between the request and uh, the effective sending of uh, troops or weapons? You won't like my answer, but it is, it depends, right? I mean, it's going to depend on what the request is um, and, uh, and how close those capabilities and resources are. I mean, we have, a, a, as you know from when we rolled out the Global Posture Review, we have a significant force presence in Europe already. Um, and uh, many of those uh, units are on rotational deployments. Uh, they can be moved about uh, fairly efficiently. Um, so there's a lot of capability in-house already on the continent General, that General Walters has at his disposal. But again, it would all come down to what the request is. Not unlike the way we handle requests for forces here domestically, right, when uh, another agency wants uh, assistance from whether it's the National Guard and vaccines or whether it's troops on the southwest border. Um, uh, there's a, a process to look at a request, to validate it, and then source it out. We're very good at that. Um, and some of those can move faster than others, again, depending on the scope and the scale and the geography. Yeah, Eric. Uh, still on Ukraine, has the U.S. government placed any conditions or restrictions on where, how, and when the Ukrainian military can use the Javelin anti-tank missiles that have been delivered so far? Our expectation for use of the Javelins, uh, Eric, uh, are that they're to be used in a self-defensive mode uh, to, for self-defense purposes. Um, but there is no geographical restriction uh, on, uh, on where they can be used inside Ukraine. We expect them to use them responsibly and for purposes of self-defense. So if they're deployed on the front lines today, they're basically to be used in any way the Ukrainian commanders see fit? They belong to the Ukrainian armed forces, Eric, and uh, our expectation when we've delivered them is, again, that they will be used responsibly for self-defense. But we have not tied them to a geographic region inside Ukraine. And, and we would expect, I mean, you didn't ask this, but I mean, all the articles that we have provided in security assistance packages, just like I told Bob, there's another package arriving this week uh, with uh, small arms and ammunition. Everything that we're providing, uh, we expect them to use responsibly and for their own self-defense. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. I have a question regarding the report that China is seeking to establish a naval military base in Equatorial Guinea. Atlantic coast of Africa. You touched on this on um, Monday in your press conference. You said that this would raise uh, national security concerns for the U.S. But it's kind of vague. What exactly are these national security concerns regarding this incident? And what would the U.S. be prepared to do, the U.S. DOD be prepared, prepared to do to counter such a move by China? I, I think I'm going to leave my answer the way it was on Monday. I, I think I'm just going to leave it there, if you don't mind. Uh, let me get back uh, to the phones. Uh, Karun Demarge in Washington Post. Thanks, John. Um, so two questions. Um, first, just going back to the um, Iran issue, um, there seems to be growing impatience among Israeli leadership with the diplomatic process and you know, more agitation towards doing something militarily. So I know you said Secretary Austin thinks that the diplomatic, uh, the diplomatic approach should lead, but what on the military side is he willing to talk about, if anything, in this meeting with Gantz tomorrow? And then my second question is, going back to the Ukraine issue, um, the NDAA that just passed the House last night and is looking to pass the Senate this week would put another 50 million on the table um, for assistance in the next fiscal year. What type of assistance is the, I, would that actually be paying for? Is it more small arms and ammunition or would it be something um, that would be more, have more power as to against Russia? Okay. So on your first question, uh, obviously I, I wouldn't, speak again to specifics of the conversation hasn't happened yet with Minister Gantz. Uh, as I said, they always talk about the threats that Iran poses. And as I also said uh, to, to Fadi, I mean, he, he, he takes seriously our responsibility to defend against uh, threats uh, in the region. And we have those capabilities uh, there in the region. He got the chance to see some of them on a recent trip out there to, uh, to, to Bahrain. I, I um, I think you can understand why it wouldn't be prudent here from the podium to speak to um, ifs and thens uh, in terms of uh, what 
uh, what might be uh, available. Our job is, as always, to provide the president options. Uh, and this job, uh, this institution, uh, is charged with providing primarily military options to the president, but ultimately those are decisions that only the commander-in-chief can make. Um, again, the secretary supports the work of diplomats and a diplomatic solution to this. He supports a return to the Iran deal, but obviously uh, negotiating that return is, is uh, is, is uh, in the hands of our diplomats at the State Department. Um, and in the meantime, he has large responsibilities to make sure that we can uh, uh, protect our national security uh, uh, interests there in the region. On Ukraine, um, yeah, I have, I, uh, we, we are aware of that, uh, of that article in the uh, pending legislation that passed the House last night. Uh, again, I don't want to get ahead of legislators. Lawmakers have to decide this. And before they can send it to uh, to the president, so um, I, I would be loath to uh, to get into specifics there. It, and to your other question about sort of what would it look like, I mean, uh, some of that could be decided by legislation itself. I mean, how specific the uh, do they write in whether this proposal passes the Senate and gets to the president's desk? I mean, it's going to it's a lot of it's going to depend on how it's written. Um, all I can tell you is that. The $60 million package that P President Biden already uh, approved, and we are now finishing up this week, uh, there is both lethal and non-lethal. There is both, you know, uh, articles in there, uh, assistance. Um, everything from Javelin uh, anti-tank missiles that uh, we talked about just a few minutes ago, to patrol boats, to, uh, to small arms and ammunition, which we talked about a little bit earlier, of course, and there's, you know, um, uh, more benign articles, uh, you know, medical assistance, that kind of thing, uh, medical articles and that kind of thing. So um, I, I, can't, I can't speak for legislation that hasn't passed yet. Uh, all I can tell you is that this administration has been willing uh, to provide security assistance items to Ukraine that, that actually really does help them defend themselves. Megan. So they first released its uh, COVID-19 guidance today for airmen who don't comply with their vaccine mandate and includes specific language for the National Guard. It does not address what will be done in the case of somewhere like Oklahoma, where you have a command that has said we don't, we're not going to enforce this, this mandate. And so you may have commanders who don't report that they have airmen or soldiers eventually, particularly in, possibly in the Army, who aren't vaccinated. What powers do the military departments have from this level to reach down into those records and do their own auditing mm. if they have to worry about commanders who are not going to report on vaccinated troops? Is that something that they can do from up here to initiate their consequences? That is a very specific question yeah. for which I have no specific answer. I'm going to have to take that one, okay. Megan. That, that one gets more detailed than, uh, than I think I'm prepared to go into right now. Um, you did, you're right, the Air Force did submit their memo. Uh, we're, uh, the, the Army will be submitting theirs um, relatively soon, we, we think. Um, and uh, again, the only other large point I'd make is this is a valid military requirement um, and a member's participation, a, their ability to participate as a National Guardsman or as a reservist, quite frankly, could be put at jeopardy if they refuse uh, if they refuse the vaccine and they're not otherwise exempted. So Mike already wrote it down. Um, I don't know how much we're going to be able to answer that, but we'll see what we can do. It may be that we point you to the, the guard bureaus, but let me let me take it, see what I can do. The question has become if you have a chain of command that is not considers itself not accountable to the secretary at this point, Understood. how can you enforce this mandate when it is up to them to enforce it? No, I, I, I get it. It's a, it's a fair question. I just, I'm not a legal expert on this, and I really don't want to venture into speculation here until we can do a thoughtful job of trying to answer it. I appreciate the thoughtful. All right. Uh, okay. Sam Legrone from USNI. Hey, John. Um, earlier, you all put out a statement um, warning about the uh, effects of a year-long CR on the Defense Department budget. Um, what do you all know that we don't? Haven't, haven't really gotten a good sense of, you know, that, that's a possibility right now. Is that uh, something that you all are trying to preempt with the statement or 
uh, just uh, trying to understand uh, how to put that into context. Thanks. Yeah, no, Sam, it's not about knowing something you don't. In fact, I rarely have found that I know something you don't. Um, but um, uh, we have sort of seen this play out before, or CRs of short duration get extended and extended. And, um, and I think this is really a chance for the secretary um, to – uh, make clear his concerns about continuing resolutions in general, but also the prospect of this going longer. Uh, and he just wanted to be on the record um, to make sure that um, our troops and our families and the American people understood the, the damage that a long-term, uh, in this case, potentially a year-long CR uh, could, could have. But it wasn't about, um, you know, it wasn't about having some specific sense of it that uh, that that you don't have, Sam. It's really about um, just making sure that um, that we make clear uh, the damage that a CR can have, particularly over the long term. Um, Wafa. Uh, hi. Uh, tomorrow, the final meeting of the Military Technical Committee in Iraq is taking place. Can you give us an insight on whether there will be uh, made an announcement regarding the end of the transition uh, to a non-combat ro combat role. Um, could we expect that tomorrow? There'll be a joint statement, Wafa, issued at the uh, at the end of the uh, of the meeting. So, um, so I would stay tuned for that. What I can tell you is that the United States will uphold our commitments, the commitments we made uh, back in July. Uh, uh, including that there will be no U.S. forces with a combat role by the end of the year. Uh, U.S. forces will remain in Iraq, of course, at the invitation of the government of Iraq uh, in, in an advising, assisting, enabling, and intelligence-sharing role to support uh, the Iraqi security forces in their fight, their continuing fight uh, against ISIS. So, again, I'd stay tuned. Uh, uh, we expect there will be a joint statement at the end of the uh, talks uh, tomorrow. Uh, okay. Um, I think I'll take one more here from the phones, and it looks like that might be doing it for us. Tony Capaccio. Hi there, John. I had a couple of questions on Ukraine. I want you to round it out a little bit. In the $60 billion package, how many of Javelons have been delivered to date on top of the roughly 360 that we've delivered over the last few years? I have an exact number for you on that, Tony. You do or do not? Do not have an exact number for you on that. All right. C can you take it as a question then? You said you had another one. Yeah. Has DOD made an additional recommendation to the White House that anything else be sent? You know, since November first, when tensions started roiling again over there. Look, I think, uh, as you know, Tony, we're a planning organization, and uh, we try to think through uh, all manner of. Uh, uh, of contingencies here. I won't um, detail uh, interagency conversations one way or the other with respect to an additional security assistance package. You heard uh, the National Security Advisor uh, yesterday talk about this in broad terms, that that's certainly an option, a possibility, should there be uh, a, a further incursion in, in, in Ukraine. But there's been no decisions made about that, Tony. Not only a decision to do it or not to do it, but if to do it, what would that look like? Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, those kinds of discussions are, are ongoing, and we're just not at that point right now. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll I appreciate it. giving them more aid if Russia invades. I mean, why not give it before Russia invades? I mean, somebody might ask you that. <laughs> somebody might ask that. Yes, you're right, Tony. Somebody might ask that. But you didn't ask that, so I think I'm going to leave it where I left it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good day.